afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the 40th Power BI Meetup Switzerland. Uh, I'm super happy to welcome you all to the December edition. As usual, we will record this session and I will make it available through Teams. And what are the topics of today? Um, I will present the latest and greatest within Power BI. The latest update has been just released two days ago. Uh, we have uh, lessons learned from optimizing enterprise data models with our special guest, Nicola. Super happy to see you. And then we have a looking back section with Dennis and myself, just to recap a little bit the whole user group, Power BI, what has been done in the last few or in the last 12 months. So more or less really a looking back section. As usual, just a few infos about the uh, user group here in Switzerland. We have four meetups in total, one uh, in now Kloten, which is the, the main area or the headquarter of, of Switzerland Microsoft. We have another one in Geneva led by Anne Fundure. Furund Arena, sorry, <laughs> and they have been already two meetups. The next one is also planned by the end of January. So if you nearby, feel free to join that as well. It will be in person if I'm not wrong. We had another one in St. Gallen, led by Rene Lechner. There also have been already six meetups. I'm not sure if another one is planned, haven't seen it so far, but I'm sure there will be more in near future as well. And lastly, the newest member led by Dennis in Basel. Um, also two meetups already done. The next one is planned on the 90th of December. And if you're interested to join or having a speech, feel free to, to reach out to him or to me as well. I will just forward it to Dennis. No worries. Uh, I don't know, Dennis, anything to add here? Uh, no, not really. I mean, the meetup is in, in our meetup scheduled. Just register. We have already a bunch of people. Um, my speaker cancelled, unfortunately, but I will find a replacement. If any one of you has an idea or a great session, uh, just let me know. And otherwise, see you in three weeks. And I promise a gift for everyone who is coming because Christmas is close. <laughs> Ooh, pro probably I can be speaker then. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you wear the hat. <laughs> okay, okay. Let, let me let me think about. It. <laughs> All right then. Moving on, <clears throat> if my PowerPoint slide wishes, there we are. And uh, just overview teams for those who who are not aware of it. We have a Teams team. Um, you can request to join via this first link. Uh, it's a forms where you have to fill in your name and email address, and you have to accept that your email and mail will be visible for others who are also in Teams. So this is GDPR stuff promising no no selling behind or anything it's really just due to gdpr stuff um, once you have access to it best is access it through the browser so you do not have to switch between the different tenants let me show that in my browser over here so i go to teams.microsoft.com log in if you have multiple tenants you will see that on the top right if you select here in my case, Microsoft now, you can select always Microsoft Guest and, and in there you will find the Power BI user group, general tab, and under files, you will find all the recordings from the previous sessions with files and everything in there. So feel free to have a look. All right, moving on with what's new in Power BI. We had uh, a few things um, comparing it to, to last time. Uh, starting from top, we now support paginated reports in Power BI Pro. So that's not a premium feature anymore. Um, we are rolling it out and it should be available globally by the end of this calendar year. So probably if you test it out right now, it could be that you get an error uh, because it's not rolled out yet, but it will be by the end of this year. So no worries. There are as well some other stuff, but let me deep dive into the specific slides. So as mentioned by the end of this year, it will be available paginated reports and talking about paginated reports, just to make you aware of it, we have a migration tool available. If you're working with SQL Server reporting services, um, you can use the migration tool to migrate your RDL files into the, let's say, paginated 
Power BI RDL files because there are some features which are not supported in the service. For example, shared data sets. Uh, so these kind of things has to be transformed and the migration tool helps you with it. Any questions to that? Any comments? Doesn't look like I got a heart. Thank you. <laughs> and talking about migration, we have as well a migration tool. If you're working with Azure Analyze services and you're thinking of going to Power BI Premium, in different scenarios, it makes sense to migrate your tabular model from AAS to Power BI Premium, on one hand to save costs, for example. And it's getting more and more attractive as we try to have a feature parity between AES and premium. It's not 100% done yet, but we're close to it, I would say. And you should really consider migrating if you're using both services. Probably you can save costs in this way. And again, we have a migration tool which helps you pretty easy to migrate from ROM to another. Uh, check it out. It's this above link. And if you wish to hear more about AES premium, we do offer as a webinar, uh, just check out this link, the second link over here, you can register. It will happen on the 5th of December. So in four days, therefore feel free to, to check it out. I see no questions, I would say, then I move on with the next one. <clears throat> The next one is coming with the latest release. We do now support in the um, in the um, small multiple charts, uh, the unshared and unsynchronized access. So this means, for example, if I look here, usually the Y axis is synced in every small multiple, but from now on you can unsync it. And you see, for example, for blue, we have 0, 50K, 100K, and for Azure, we have 0 and 5K, so really a different axis at the end. And this is pretty easy doable. Let me show that quickly live uh, for you. So if I switch here to Power BI Desktop, I have here my report, and once you create a small multiple, so let me just show that pretty easy. I have here a line chart and if you add another an other dimension into your small multiples, so let me go for example by customer, is that useful? Yes it is. You see per default uh, you will always get the same axis. But what you can do is if you go to the format tab at the top, if it would be a little bit faster, it's coming. I can go to the y-axis, and in there, okay, my, my PC is really slow, sorry for that. Um, you have here this option now, shared Y-axis, you can turn it on or off. In my case, it's now off, so therefore it's not sharing the same axis. And you can then turn on scale to fit once you turned off the shared Y-axis, meaning it will then really scale and have a, a nice better overview of your line chart in each small multiple at the end. So for example, if I turn it on, just to show you, now everything has the same, uh, the same uh, Y-axis, it's zero and two million as you see, but if I turn it off, it will adjust. And if I say scale to fit, if I turn it off again, same visual, if I turn it on, each small multiple will adjust accordingly. Pretty nice feature from my point of view. It works as well for the bar chart, uh, but in this case, it will be then for the X axis, not for the Y one, so all for the numeric value at the end. Any questions? Doesn't look like. Let me then move on with the next one. And this one is pretty awesome from my point of view because you can now use field parameters to create dynamic slicers. So which means you can have two different slicers and one can influence the other. And for example, in my, in my visual, uh, here in my screenshot, I see if I select product, the second slicer will be influenced by my selection of products. So I will see like the sub products of it. And if I would choose model, my slicer over here would change and showing me only model. And how this is done, let me show that as well, back to my report. 
let me uh, go to instead of uh, oh no, sorry, I have to select the slicer. In my slicer, you see I already created a field parameter uh, uh, containing show that containing different kind of, of fields uh, like uh, the sales territory, like the, the city customer, and so on. And those are visible at the top. And what I did, let me delete that so I can start from scratch to see to show you what I did is I could really just copy and paste it. And once done, it looks like a little bit like I have just one because I select a color and therefore the other one is also color. And on my second slicer, all I have to do is now I have to go here to the field to the parameter, this little arrow here. Select it and say show values of selected field. And if done, now my, my slicer is really um, is really depending on my first one. So if I select brand, for example, you see it's showing only brand. If I go to stock item, it's showing me stock item and so on. So really nice experience. Any questions to that? All right. If not, let me move on. I will not go to the presentation mode just to show that uh, it's a little bit easier. We now have a new optimized ribbon tab, which will help you to optimize your report, especially if you're working in the direct query uh, mode. This means, for example, if I go to Power BI again, if I go here now, you see here optimize. If I select it, you can now pause visuals, meaning if I pause it, and this is especially interesting if direct query, if I select a filter, not every other visual will automatically refresh. And you will see, like in this case, that you get a refresh button for each visual. And you can now really select every, um, let's say every filter, every selection that you wish to do. And once you're done, you hit the refresh button and then the report will load. So therefore you're not losing time and waiting for that everything loads and then you select the next one and then again and again and again. And this is also uh, pretty awesome from my point of view, as mentioned, in an import mode, it's okay, but even more uh, valuable if you work with direct query. One thing to show is as well, the optimi uh, optimization presets, the presets, this means usually you have interactivity. So therefore, if I select something, other um, other uh, visuals will automatically reload and interact and so on. But you can also say, I wish to query reduction presets. I wish to have that. And in this case, uh, it will not also automatically load once you, you select something. Again, uh, cannot show that uh, because it's in import mode, not in direct query. It's a little bit hard to show here, but I hope the explanation was good enough. Are there any questions for that? Any any Comments, anything? All right. I hear my wife screaming. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so let me go back to PowerPoint. Come on, PowerPoint is a little bit slow. So then two more things. Uh, subscribe to a report with filters applied. So finally, if you now create a subscription in Power BI service, you have an option saying include my changes. And this will save your current filters, your current slicers. Even if you personalize your visual, this will also be saved every cross filtering, cross highlighting. Uh, so more or less every, uh, the, the whole state of the report will be saved within the subscription and you will get it as a screenshot. And if you selected the link, you will also get to the selection that you did on your report. Pretty nice feature. Um, I mean, there is not much to show. Uh, probably if I open a report just to show where this button can be found. If you see here and say subscribe to report, add subscription, here, is, here it is. This is the new thing now, which will save the current state of your selection. Question to that? Yes, one question. Please. Um, is this only possible for uh, workspace members or is it uh, possible too for uh, the audience of an app? 
I think it's also po uh, audience of an app. Um, I don't think of an audience because in the audience itself, you also add users or a group. And what you can do on a subscription, you can add the same group like to the audience. I think that's th this would be the way. I'm not sure if I'm getting it. I mean, uh, are you, you you mean the audience of, of a Power BI app, right? Yes, or um, every single member who is um, in that audience. So is it po uh, possible from a um, published app to subscribe on a single report page? Oh, or is uh, it only possible when I'm a, I'm a um, workspace member, viewer or contributor? Uh, I think you can also subscribe to apps, not on a single page, but on the whole report then. You can subscribe in a report in an app also. Right. Okay. Yeah, I just checked it. I was also not sure, but I in parallel just checked that it has a subscribe button every report okay. in an app. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Any further questions? All right. Then with that, let me show the last one, which is linked metrics. Also very good, very useful if you're working with scorecards and metrics in, in, in Power BI service, uh, which means you do not have to duplicate now your metrics. You can really create one and link to it. Meaning if you link it into another scorecard and update it, everything will be synced. If you update it on one place, at every other place, it will also be updated as you did. And it's pretty easy doable. Let me show that as well if I go here to metrics if i have okay no scorecard let me create one and if i say blah 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 um, at the top right here you have the new button you can create a new one and and create as usual a new metric and as you see you can link to an existing metric and if i would select that it would open up all my scorecards that i have access to unfortunately i don't have any but you can uh, just then select the scorecard, select the metric that you wish, and it will be added to your scorecard, regardless where the workspace is in which you created the scorecard. So it's uh, across workspace, across scorecards. And as mentioned, if I would, for example, change the status, the, ch uh, the status will also be changed in the original metrics, and therefore it's syncing. Any questions to that? Yes, I have one question to that to um, to the complete audience here to the participants. I think we are around about 50 people. Who of you is using the metrics or the goals in Power BI? I'm just interested in um, is there any company who really used that behind? So I didn't see it until now. Probably just raise your hands then we can see it. It would be great. Okay, One, no Dominic. Race so far. One. <laughs> yeah, but we're just uh, we're just fooling around with it, so it's not nothing productive. We, uh, we have some some sales goals that we we want to achieve, and uh, we hook up Bexio with um, with Power BI. Um, but it's nothing like world changing, so uh, maybe I don't count. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Then let me move on, switch here to my presentation mode. And as usual, if you wish to keep up, sorry, if you wish to keep up to date, there is a power. Power BI uh, release plan. You can check it out on the on the second link. Uh, there is also a Power BI app which you can just install or check it in the uh, data storage gallery by this link, where you will see what kind of features are planned. Is it public, preview, or general available? And with that, I'm super happy to have Nicola here uh, to present a little bit about the lessons learned from optimizing enterprise data models. I'm even more happy that you that we have it today because tomorrow, who knows if you would join the Swiss <laughs> Power BI user group. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. It depends. It depends. <laughs> no, thank yeah. you very much for being here. And yeah, the stage is all yours.
thanks, thanks, thanks uh, for inviting me and thanks for this nice overview of the latest features. Uh, I also skipped this last official video, so uh, this was a great chance also for me to to pick up the latest things. So thanks, okay. thanks once again for sharing. Okay, then I'll start sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes, we perfect, see it. perfect. Then hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, uh, depending on which part on the planet you currently are. Uh, and welcome to Power BI User Group Switzerland December meeting uh, from my side as well. Uh, today I want to share with you multiple lessons learned from optimizing enter enterprise scale data models. So the tips, tricks and techniques that I'm going to share with you today are of course relevant for smaller models as well, but uh, uh, it may happen that you don't notice a significant difference in performance on simple and small models. However, things we are going to discuss are generally applicable and are considered as general recommended practices, nevertheless of the size and complexity of your data model. Before we start, just a short introduction. Uh, my name is Nikola Ilic. Uh, I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but I live uh, close to Switzerland. I live in Austria in the beautiful city of Salzburg. And uh, that's why I've chosen this nickname, Data Mozart. You probably know that Salzburg is famous as a birthplace of this uh, uh, great composer. So I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why I'm trying to make music from the data. Uh, you can find me on web. I'm blogging at data-mozart.com. I'm also active on uh, social media, LinkedIn, Twitter. So feel free to connect if you like. Uh, professionally, I'm coming from uh, traditional Microsoft business intelligence tech, so working with uh, relational databases, uh, uh, analysis services, multidimensional integration services, reporting services, and most recently, I would say in the last five years or so, uh, with Power BI. Privately, father of two kids and true football and Barca fan, as you may conclude if you look at the photo uh, on the screen where I was a little bit younger, I would say. OK, so what's in for you today? Uh, I'll share with you five lessons that I've learned while optimizing enterprise data models. Each of these lessons may be applied individually, but also, and I would say it would be desirable uh, in synergy with others that we are going to cover. One more, one more important thing to keep in mind, all these lessons are based on true stories. That means I pick them up while working on real life projects. And, you know, because we are talking about enterprise environments, people tend to think that these huge enterprises, uh, these well-known companies are using always the most sophisticated, some super high tech solutions. That's not always the case. Uh, trust me, not once in those environments I witnessed first handed many misconceptions and not following recommended practices when it comes to Power BI development. Who is this session for? Uh, well, I assume that is a kind of a next step in the Power BI journey. So I will consider as its name suggests. That means that you are not, I'll assume at least, that you are not rookies anymore and that you've already gained a foundational understanding of the Power BI architecture and tabular model in general. Of course, feel free to ask a question and enter a discussion if something is not clear, but generally keep in mind that uh, this is a session more for advanced Power BI practitioners. What not to expect? Well, when you are dealing with huge amounts of data, your performance tuning toolbox should consist of certain skill set and knowledge that goes above and beyond basic general recommendations. So I will not teach you how to design a beautiful and visually appealing report. Uh, therefore, if you're searching for some data visualization type uh, tips, uh, uh, I would say you are in the wrong place. Sorry, but that's how it is. Once again, a disclaimer that I want you to keep in mind for the rest of this session. When you are working with smaller models, meaning anything below 1 million records, Power BI is like a kitchen sink. So you can throw whatever you want and Power BI will suck in everything, meaning you don't have to worry about many, many, many things. And I'll try to give you a simple analogy. Imagine that you are riding a bike and you don't put hands on the steering wheel. So 
for example, you enjoy the sun like this lady on the on the photo, or maybe you are having an urgent urgent phone call, but your hands are not on a steering wheel. And you will probably reach your destination if there are no there is no traffic, no crossroads, uh, no damaged road, and so on. However, once you face any of these challenges, you will probably find yourself on the ground, and I hope not hardly injured. Translated to Power BI, maybe applying some of these techniques that we'll discuss today will not make you a Power BI hero immediately, especially if your data models are smaller and simpler. But I sincerely hope that you will thank me one day when your data grows uh, uh, large and uh, becomes more and more complex to handle. OK, so let's start with lesson number one, and it's about direct query. And I hear you, I hear you, we shouldn't use direct query in the first place. Well, yes, that's universal truth, general recommendation to use import mode whenever possible. But I already warned you that uh, sometimes you must go above and beyond that. So here is my scenario. Uh, there is a fact table consisting of approximately 70 million rows, and it's in the direct query storage mode. The reason for using direct query uh, over input mode is quite interesting because obviously not a lot, it's not a, a, a large amount of data. 70 million records are no blocker at all for import mode, especially because the client was using a premium capacity. The reason for using direct query was some data security requirements because the way it works uh, is that uh, deployment process is done through Azure DevOps. Repos in Azure DevOps are not certified for that data privacy level. Uh, underlying Azure SQL database is certified. So to cut the story short, requirement for creating a Power BI report is that it must use direct query over Azure SQL database. And it worked OK within the client setup, but we managed to make it even more performant, not just in terms of speed, but also in terms of resource consumption. And you know what's best? Uh, we managed to do it without some complex model redesign, creating some uh, additional tables and so on. So just rewriting a few DAX measures to leverage the brain of the formula engine. Credits for the original idea for this solution goes to uh, Microsoft's Phil Simark, and I strongly encourage you to visit Phil's blog at tax.tips, not just because of this tip, but also many other uh, great solutions uh, to various Power BI challenges. So let me show you this very simple technique for optimizing direct query scenario and what happens behind the scenes once you leverage this technique. Yeah, so I'll well. switch to. Sorry. OK, I, I thought I heard something. No problem. Uh, so what's the trick here? Uh, there is an optimization concept in tabular engine, which is called DAX fusion. In a nutshell, what this concept provides is that if there is a possibility uh, to combine together multiple similar storage engine queries into one query. And even though we are talking here about storage engine queries, don't forget that the formula engine is in fact responsible for uh, creating a query plan, generating, generating the queries, which are then executed by the storage engine. So essentially we are picking up the brain of the formula engine here to reduce the number of calls from formula engine to storage engine. There are two types of DAX fusions in uh, Power BI, vertical and horizontal, uh, which basically combines uh, this vertical fusion, which was uh, uh, present here up until last month was the, the only fusion present. Uh, it basically combines multiple columns with the same where clause into one query. Uh, but in this case, we want to leverage another fusion type, which is a horizontal fusion, uh, which essentially operates over one single column, or to be more specific, the fusion of multiple measures that are all referencing one single column. Uh, so in this scenario, let me quickly show you what they have. So I have a fact sales table. Let's assume that this is my table of 70 million rows, and I have uh, different measures that are already prepared in advance. So what is the idea here? Uh, I have four selling channels in my company. Those selling channels are online, catalog, uh, reseller and store. Now, 
very common business request is to understand how many sales each of those channels performed. And I will show you now what they have. So if I turn on uh, performance analyzer, start recording and let's move to my direct query page. So I have two tables on uh, my report page, both of them uh, showing exactly the same results. So the one on the top uh, is using, let's call them th uh, those classic measures. So let me show you what they have here. Just a simple calculate, count rows, and then as a filter, I'm providing a uh, channel key, which is three. In our case, that's catalog. Uh, channel key two is online and so on and so on. And basically I have four different measures that are executed within this table on the top. Then down below, I have another table that displays exactly the same results. But here I rewrote those measures in a slightly different way. So you see that DAX is a little more complicated. So we include this max X iterator functions and combining some different logic. So I have base total base measure, which is this one, which just counting rows. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to explain why this DAX is written like this. Therefore, I've included uh, links to Phil's, Phil Simark's blog, blog post where he explained in detail why this DAX is, is written like this. But what I wanted to show you here, so I have two tables. So let me show you what's happening behind the scenes. If I take the query that's being generated by the table on the top with uh, traditional measures, and let's go to DAX Studio. And I will turn on server timings. And let's paste our query here, only DAX query, and run this query. Let's go to server timings. So this query took 207 milliseconds, and we have four separate queries, four separate uh, direct queries generated. This is the first one with left outer join, and you see in the where clause it says where channel key is three, then the second one is exactly the same, just the where clause uh, condition is different. So channel key is one, uh, this one and this one. So we have four different storage engine queries, as you may also notice here, four different storage engine queries. If we go back to Power BI Desktop, let's grab the other one, the other query from our table Fusion Visual. So I'll go and copy this query, go back to DAX Studio, and again, you see that it looks exactly the same from DAX perspective. Let's see what's happening behind the scenes when, once we execute this query. So here we have 207 milliseconds for four separate SQL queries. If I execute this one, 119 milliseconds, just one query, one storage engine query, see? And in this case, what happens is that uh, logic of this query is different because now we don't have where clause, we have a uh, group by clause introduced, no left outer joints and uh, 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 all the other potential performance bottlenecks. So in this case, Formula Engine was smart enough to generate one single query and to retrieve all four results in one run and ask for Storage Engine to do uh, this just once. Now, up until a month ago, you should uh, you should have do things like that. Uh, Month ago, Microsoft introduced horizontal fusion out of the box. So I intentionally left it uh, disabled for this demo. I know there are some people from Microsoft in this call, Christian, Roman, and maybe someone else. So let's see if your feature is working or not. So I'll go to options and settings, options. It's still in preview. That's why it's not enabled by default. So here it is. You see horizontal fusion one of the latest ones, one of the latest features. So let's, uh, okay, and let me close this one and I will, I will open it again to make sure that it's active. Let's see if that works out of the box. I'm really curious. Okay. 
Okay, let's turn on performance analyzer, start recording, go to direct query. Let me first check if this is enabled. I don't want to jump into some conclusions. Okay, so horizontal fusion is enabled now. Let's see the query be be behind our table regular. So I will copy this query and let's go to DAX Studio. DAX query only. Let's execute this one. Server timings are here, that's fine. Ah, I need to reconnect, sorry, because uh, there is a new local host behind. Uh, DAX Studio. Server timings. And let's paste our query and run this query. Cool, so it works. Now you don't need to write this exotic DAX anymore. And I need to change my demo for the future presentations. Uh, but honestly, I'm happy that this is available now out of the box. And uh, uh, you can turn on this horizontal fusion preview feature and uh, take advantage of it. Uh, it will speed up your direct query queries in those scenarios where you have uh, multiple different measures that uh, target one single column within your data model. Okay. Nicola, Nicola yeah. probably one quick question for those who are not that technical, deep technical. Um, can you probably in a, uh, explain what, what exactly the formula engine and the storage engine, but why is it so important to have just one? Yeah, uh, they're a good question. Yeah, so I, I'll try to uh, to simplify as much as possible. So we have two main parts uh, within this whole architecture behind Power BI: formula engine and storage engine. So formula engine is kind of a brain of Power BI architecture. Uh, so when you write DAX code, formula engine accepts this request and uh, translates DAX uh, either to SQL. In this case, if we are using direct query and generates the query plan. And once this query plan is generated, then storage engine executes the query plan. And then storage engine literally goes through the data in storage engine, uh, in, which is stored in Vertipack database if we are using import mode, or your requests are being pushed directly to a data source if we are using direct query mode. So storage engine is literally like a strong guy, muscles of Power BI that takes this data and returns back to formula engine. Uh, storage engine is super fast. It works multi-threaded, but it's not so smart. So it can resolve just some simple operations like some like mean, maximum, uh, some basic mathematical operations uh, like subtraction, uh, uh, addition, uh, multiplication, and so on. For everything else, storage engine relies on formula engine. So formula engine can resolve everything. Uh, and the most important thing, why this, why the, the key thing is that you force to push more work on storage engine. As I said, storage engine works in a multi-threaded way, while formula engine works in a single-threaded way. So it's uh, expect expectable that if more work has to be done with on formula engine side, since it works in formula in a one uh, single-threaded way, more time will be needed to complete this request. On the other hand side, you can get, take the benefit of parallelism in storage engine, and therefore uh, uh, a recommendation is to always push as much possible work to storage engine uh, uh, as you can. Great. Hopefully if this may... was not too, too, much, too confusing. <laughs> no, everything good. I mean, uh -huh. if I may, I once hear this analogy and I like it very much. Um, imagine if you go to the supermarket and you have like a list what you have to buy. And usually you do go once to the supermarket and bring everything with you. And this is what you try with the storage engine. You go there and bring everything with you. And if you go multiple times, that it doesn't make sense. You don't go buy milk, come home, go again, buy eggs, go come home, go again, go for bread, whatever. This is a little bit of difference between formula and storage engine. I, I think this analogy helped me a lot to understand what really the benefit yeah, is. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I agree. That's a great analogy. Okay, thanks. thanks. Didn't want Thank to interrupt, you. just want to make sure that. No it, worries, that... no worries. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks. Good I... analogy, by the way. Thank thanks. you. I, I think I we have a think question. There's one question, yeah. Yep. 
please, Vladimir. Hi, guys. Good morning. Um, greetings from Costa Rica. <laughs> These are, these are great calls all the time. Um, one of the biggest issues that I currently have is that most of or some of our reports are based on a regular download of an Excel file, and we don't have a way of changing that architecture because it's it's historic. So it's it's been growing exponentially after two years. Now the query is taking a long time to analyze, but I, I know no better way to do one because it has to literally go through each file. So my question, is there any way we can apply this when it's on a, on a folder where we perform a download each month or each week? If I may, um, in such a scenario, if it's too slow, what I would try is instead of connecting with Power BI directly, work probably with a data flow or now with data marts and push it in there and then with Power BI connect to it. And then you have like this middle layer, which is data flow, let's say, which does the transformation and loading and everything. And once done, you can just connect with Power BI to it and you 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 shift a little bit the, the work out of Power BI. I don't know any any other options. I, yeah, I mean, I Nicola, agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And also, not just one data flow. You can create multiple data flows. So, and uh, even more split this work that has to be done. Yeah. Also, uh, maybe monitor the guy in the cube channel. I talked with uh, Patrick uh, two weeks ago. They will soon release a video how you can incremental refresh on files so that you don't have to load all the files all the time. So check it out. They will release a video soon. OK, ah, thank cool. you very much. Thanks. OK, so to wrap up this lesson by just adjusting the DAX logic or, or turning on this new feature in Power BI Desktop, uh, we were able to reduce the number of storage engine queries and consequentially reduce the time for rendering the visual. As I promised, I'm sharing the links to Phil Simark's blog posts that explain in detail how this technique works and why the DAX used in this example is written like it is. Uh, final words to keep in mind here, DAX fusion, no matter how powerful is, may only happen if you place all the measures within a single visual, like I did here, for example, in a table. If you distribute them across multiple visuals, let's say that I've used four cards to display those numbers, then storage engine queries can't be fused. There, there is no fusion happening. Okay, let's move to lesson number two. This time, no more direct query, but uh, we are now operating in import mode. Uh, however, this time there is no premium li license. We are facing all the limitations of the shared capacity. But our job is to make the client happy, and the client is not happy if we simply tell them to take the money out of their pocket and pay for the premium. So the scenario is following. Uh, customer support department of the client needs to analyze number of chats per period of the day. So they can decide and assign a proper number of uh, support agents in the morning, afternoon, evening, and so on. And here is what they come up with. So they imported data about when the specific chat started so they can perform an analysis of the number of chats in a certain period of the day. Sure thing, because they need that information on a granularity that is lower than day, they imported the original column as a date time data type and applied certain transformations using DAX to display numbers per hour in the report itself. And that was working pretty fine when they started. Uh, how many times have all of us heard this uh, sentence worked fine in the past? Yes. Not just when they started, to be honest, but also for quite a while. Till they had a few tens of thousands of records. But as I've already told you, some issues pop up only when the amount of data becomes large. And that's exactly what happened here. So at a certain point after some time, uh, when the data size reached uh, one gigabyte maximum limit for the pro license, they weren't able to use this report anymore. So let's see what can be done in this scenario. First, I'll go to uh, another uh, Power BI desktop file that I prepared. And in this case, let me show you what I have. So uh, I'll go to Power Query just to show you what they imported. So this is chat's table. Uh, of course, data model in reality contained different uh, dimension uh, 
uh, tables, but I uh, omitted them from this example. They are not relevant in this case. So they imported this date team start table as you may see on a, uh, within uh, using date time data type. So going to a second level of precision and what they did. Let's go here and. Go to cardinality. So what they did here basically. This is the idea. This is the business use case. So they want to uh, understand for each hour. They want to extract the hour and then understand how many chats occurred within the specific hour. So in this case, you see that all the chats that started between, I don't know, uh, 30000 PM, they belong to 15. That's how we express uh, uh, 3 PM uh, in Europe. Then all the uh, all the chats that started between 830 uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 899.99 belongs to 9 and so on and so on. So that's the logic. And that's what they come up with. So they created a calculated column index leveraging our and M round functions. And this is the table populated that shows total number uh, of chats for every single hour. So total chats is just a count of chat IDs for every distinct hour in data model. Nothing special, very simple, and that worked. OK, and numbers are numbers are correct. So what I did here. I just extracted uh, hours from uh, this column, the original column. So I just rounded uh, all the values within the Power Query Editor. So no, in, not index in Power Query Editor. And let's see what is the difference if there is any. So let me just quickly copy paste this table and here instead of the original one, this is the table that uh, basically I've used. So I have this rounded to hour and I have total chats per hours. You see the numbers are the same, they are matching. So we have the same, uh, we have correct results. And if I take a look at uh, the numbers behind those two tables, again, I will use Deck Studio. So let's open an, another instance of Deck Studio. And in this case, instead of server timings, I will leverage Vertipack Analyzer built in tool uh, within Deck Studio that can help you understand various numbers behind your data model. And here are our two tables. This is the original one that I've shown you with date time, uh, date time column type. It takes 680 megabytes, just one column with 9 million rows, 680 megabytes. This is the this is another one which produces basically the same outcome. It's one third of this original column, 214 megabytes. This can be probably more optimized, but just by uh, pushing the logic, the transformation logic from DAX to Power Query, uh, basically we enable Vertipack to optimally compress the data. We reduce the cardinality because let me show you here. And here, if I expand it a little bit, maybe you see there is our column date team start UTC. So they were wondering, OK, date team start UTC we have at a uh, uh, second level of precision, but we uh, got rid of, of minutes and seconds in our Power BI report. Yes, but data is still stored in, in the way that you imported it in Power BI. So uh, whatever you do in DAX to transform your data, doesn't impact the way the data is stored behind the scenes. And going back here, uh, lesson learned here, reduce the cardinality. That's uh, uh, that's the most important lesson learned because number of distinct values in the column is your biggest enemy when it comes to data model size. So try to reduce the cardinality whenever possible. That is kind of a general rule, general recommendation, not strictly related to this example. Uh, the specific lesson learned from these stories formatting will not change the way the data is stored in Power BI. It just displays the numbers in a different format, but the underlying data types with all their pros and cons, they stay unchanged beneath the surface. Okay, we are already at lesson number three. And I like this one. You know why? Because there is a direct query mode again. 
just kidding, I'm a huge opponent of, of direct query, but sometimes you simply don't have another option than to go this way. So in this scenario, client had a giant fact table with 500 plus million rows. And my first question was, what level of detail does a report user need to see in the report? I was thinking of decreasing the data granularity and pre-aggregating values in advance uh, uh, on certain attributes. But I've been told that even though majority of uh, uh, business requests will target aggregated data on a day and or product uh, uh, level, users still need the possibility to drill down to a single transaction. And I was thinking, great, that's a perfect case for composite models feature in synergy with aggregations. So I've advised client to create pre-aggregated tables containing data on the level of granularity that they need, date, date and product, and I think it was also date and store. Uh, and after a few days, I received another call. The client told me, hey, Nicola, we created tables as per your suggestion. We established relationships between dimension tables and aggregated tables, but the performance is still the same, meaning performance still sucks. And we checked the queries in performance analyzer and we are still seeing direct query queries, even though our visuals contain the data on a granularity that exactly matches the aggregated table. Okay, so I replied, did you configure aggregation awareness? And that was like, aggregation, what? And I immediately knew what was going on. So let me show you again. Go to our direct query. So three tables that I have here. Let me just for a moment stop uh, performance analyzer and let me show you what they, what they have here. So they have the original fact table, this one, the big one, 500 plus million rows. They have three aggregated tables. Uh, one that uh, aggregates data just on a day level, the other that aggregates data on a day and product level, and third that aggregates data on a date and store level. So they created that those three tables uh, on the data source. They use import mode. Uh, they set dimension tables to dual storage mode. So everything is everything looks good. But why aggregation still doesn't work in Power BI? That that was the question. That was the problem. And if I show you here, let's again turn on and refresh visuals. You see that it's utterly slow. So we have direct query for each of those tables. I mean, why do we have direct query? We have data on a level of granularity that matches this one, for example, and this one, for example. So why do we get a direct query? Creating aggregation, uh, aggregated tables, setting storage modes, establishing relationships that's all good but Power BI still doesn't have idea that you want to use to, that you want to remap your queries to those aggregated tables so what they forgot to do or they didn't know to do is to make power bi aware of how it's done uh, just simply click on those three dots manage aggregations and here i want to summarize my sales amount from the original online sales table. Here it is. So this table was already hidden. They they uh, uh, they make table hidden, but they didn't uh, set this. And uh, here I need to again select sum and from online sales and sales amount. Okay, and for the third one repeating the same steps. So I need some, I need online sales and I need sales amount. OK, now if we go back. Let's clear this and refresh visuals. So now you see that if I sort this in by total time in descending order, you see no more direct query and I will copy this query from uh, from Power BI and let's open another instance of Tech Studio just to show you what happens in the background. So I didn't change anything in the Power BI report itself. If I turn on server timings and I paste this query, let's execute this query and go to server timings. Here, this row which says match found. And here on the right hand side, you see that 
uh, our query was mapped from the original table, which is online sales to online sales aggregated per date. Now, what is also very important when you are making Power BI aware of aggregations? Uh, there are, of course, there are multiple things, but one of the most important things, especially if you have a 500 million uh, fact table, uh, that is around that was around five years of data. So this table here that aggregates data on a day level contains around 2000 rows because five years of days, that's around 2000 rows. Then this one, which uh, basically uh, increases the granularity of the of the table. This one, uh, let's imagine that uh, they have 50 products in their offer. So 50 products multiplied by 2000 days. This table has around 100,000 rows. And then this final one, for example, uh, that uh, uh, increases granularity additionally, let's say that you have 50, row, 50 stores and 100,000 rows multiplied by 50, that's 5 million rows. So this aggregated table has 5 million rows. This table here has 2,000 rows. And I don't need to tell you which one is uh, uh, yeah, more efficient to scan. Obviously, this one with smaller number of rows. So why I'm talking this? Uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a property here in Manage Aggregations window, which is called precedence. This means if you have multiple aggregated tables uh, and you don't set this precedence value, so by default it will be zero, always zero. So what is going to happen? Uh, for this visual here, Power BI will arb arbitrarily choose which aggregated table to use. So it may happen that because uh, this one, this query can be satisfied from any of our aggregated tables, it can use this one with 5 million rows instead of the one with 2000. So by setting this precedence value, as I did here, uh, manage aggregations, here is 10, and I set here probably to some other value, here is 5. So Whenever Power BI checks our aggregated table and checks the query and says, OK, uh, this one, I need just date. So I will go uh, check table with highest precedence. In our case, this is the one with smaller number of rows. And if I can pull data from there, I will pull data from there. I will not scan this table from of 5 million rows. That's why it is important also not just to uh, to to set aggregations, to manage aggregations, but also to set this precedence value properly, uh, meaning that if you have multiple aggregated tables, uh, put the highest precedence value on the table that has uh, the highest granularity. So one question to you, uh, because we have three different, I will not refresh our visuals, one question to you is because we have three different uh, aggregation aggregated tables. One is per date, the other is per date and product, the third is per date and store. What do you think? Can this table here, date, product and store, can this be satisfied from aggregated tables? Because we have all these attributes. Few of you just yes, no. Yes. Okay, let's check. Yes. Let's check. Ha, ah, looks like you're wrong. It took five seconds and we have direct query. Why is that happening? In order for aggregations to work, you need to have data on the exact matching level of granularity like in your visual. So in this case, my visual uh, groups the data on date, product and store. So I don't have this combination that covers all of these uh, uh, at, at the certain uh, at the same level of granularity. I have date, date and product, date and store, but I don't have date, product and store. That's the problem and that's why this one will not work. So I will need to create aggregated table that will include all of these attributes and uh, match the level of granularity of this visual. Okay, so let's recap Nicola. what... Yeah. One question to the last um, example from you. Um, did you test it that with Power BI Premium and with automated aggregation, 
or is that uh, the customer was also on on the um, pro license and no in this case customer wasn't premium license but that was user defined aggregations so that happened like maybe a year ago before automatic aggregations okay right. i'm not sure how uh, automatic aggregations uh, should handle this yeah uh, i think it's a kind of black box so I still prefer having uh, control, full control over over aggregation settings. But okay. a good question, good question, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so again, let's recap what we've learned in this lesson. Uh, aggregations are one of the most powerful optimization features in Power BI, especially when we are dealing with large fact tables. However, bear in mind that even though Power BI is smart enough to remap the query and pull the data from the more performant aggregated table as a prerequisite, you have to make it aware of those aggregated tables. OK, this one is prof for professionals, uh, real professionals. And do you know why? Because real professionals use external tools to enhance their Power BI development. And lesson number four can't be learned by using exclusively Power BI Desktop as a development tool. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. I, I'm uh, I'm sad that we are not in you know one room, so I can see all of you, because I would ask you to to raise your hands, all of you who recognized good old MDX. Okay, maybe it's just old, not so good, but anyway, uh, MDX is the language for querying. SQL Server Analysis Multidimensional Models. So when you use MDX, SQL Server Analysis Services creates automatically for you attribute hierarchies. And that structure looks something like this. So all of you who used to work with cubes probably are aware of this structure here. But what's the deal with attribute hierarchies? You can use a column from the hierarchy and use this column both as a row and a column in your MDX query. OK, nice, but what's the deal with MDX at all? I mean, am I in the ram, right room, right session? I mean, this is session on Power BI, right? Not on SQL Server Analysis Services. And Power BI is all about tabular, about DEX, not multidimensional and MDX, right? So the fair question would be, what on earth does MDX have in common with Power BI? Instead of answering, I will ask you a question. Which language does Excel use when connecting to analysis services tabular model? And small hint, it's not DEX. MDX. <laughs> Correct. Yes, Excel generates MDX queries when connecting to analysis services tabular model. And this brings us to a very important takeaway. As Excel relies on MDX, it also relies on the data structures that are present in the multidimensional model, including those attribute hierarchies. So maybe you didn't know, but there is a property hidden deeply uh, within the tabular model that is called is available in MDX, which is by default set to true. This means that unless you explicitly set this is available in MDX property to false, uh, these attribute hierarchies will be part of your data model. Now the next question is why this property is not then by default set to false? Well, this is how your Excel users will look if this property would have been disabled by default. So in many real life cases, uh, Excel is the tool of choice for many data analysts and they should be able to connect to analysis services tabular model behind the Power BI because don't forget Power BI stores the data in the instance of analysis services tabular. So if this property is disabled by default, they shouldn't be able to perform their analysis. And what's even more interesting, most of the Power BI developers are not aware of this property at all. And why they should? I mean, it's not accessible from the Power BI desktop. Attribute hierarchies are not visible in the Power BI desktop at all. While in the Power BI itself, you will not notice any difference in the numbers displayed in the visuals. So why bother with it when, you know, everything works perfectly in Power BI, while your Excel analysts are happy and creating their pivot tables using the data from the Power BI datasets. And now we come to the point when this can matter, to the point that in certain 
scenario helped me make some good improvements uh, in the client's Power BI solution. Uh, so I don't want to waste the time demonstrating the difference between Excel and Power BI when you are displaying data stored uh, in the tabular model. There is a great blog post from Chris Webb uh, where you can read all the details uh, how it behaves in Excel versus Power BI. But I would rather focus on differences in the data model performance when this property is enabled or disabled. So let's go to Power BI Desktop, mm, this one, okay? And as I said, you can't locate this property anyway in Power BI Desktop, but before I show you how it's done from within Tabular Editor, uh, I need to say that there are two possible options if you decide to play around with uh, this is available in MDX property. First, set the property uh, value to false for all the columns in your data model, meaning no Excel analysis at all. So the main question here is, do you want to restrict connecting to the data model from Excel completely? That's the first option. The second option is set the prep property of this value to false for some columns in your data model, namely non-attribute columns such as uh, facts, we are talking about measures, and key columns, because they should be hidden as a recommended practice, they should be hidden anyway. Uh, this will still enable Excel connections, but it will, uh, for these disabled columns, they will not be available as part of the hierarchy. Uh, in real life case, I will show you now on this example that we have like 9 million rows, but in real life case, fact table had 300 and something uh, million rows and many, many, many dimensions, some of them containing two or three million records. Uh, therefore, the performance improvement was even more uh, remarkable. Uh, so let me show you what I'm talking about. This time I will open Tabular Editor. OK, and here is our data model. Let me show you those. Uh, this. Famous uh, property here, so let's check chat ID. And if I scroll down, I told you it's hidden deeply in the tabular model here under options available in MDX. And it's set to true by default, as I told you. So before I show you, uh, I don't know which De Deck Studio is relevant now. Ah, I think this one, okay. So pay attention to this number here, hierarchy size, because attribute hierarchies are part of total hierarchy size within the data model. So total hierarchy size at this moment is 121 megabytes. On this table, small table of 9, meg, uh, uh, nine million rows, it's 121 megabytes. OK, now if we go back to tabular editor, I will just set to three, four uh, columns just to show you how it works and what is the difference. Let's take first four columns uh, here and set to false. Of course, you can do this with scripts uh in tabular editor but just for the sake of simplicity let's stop here and false okay i'll save this back to power bi desktop and where i am here okay hopefully this is saved let me refresh this tech studio look at this now it was 121 megabytes. Now it's eight megabytes. So just four columns. I just set false to four columns. That's, I mean, you never will, you will never put them uh, as a row in pivot table. No, no point in putting chat ID. What does that mean? Doesn't provide any any business meaning to have surrogate key as a row in, on the pivot table. So all those table, all those columns that are that should be hidden in your data model you can play safe bet and uh, set this property to false. Again, you don't need to worry if your data model size is small, but once it starts to grow, you can make some really, really, really good savings. It's not just that it, it saves you the memory, but also once you do the refresh of these partitions, uh, these uh, structures uh, are rebuilt from scratch. So you should also uh, uh, notice uh, performance improvement in terms of data refresh process because those hierarchy size is now eight megabytes instead of 121 megabytes. So that's also something to to keep in mind. 
as I said, there is a great extension in, or maybe I didn't say, say but uh, uh, anyway, there is a great extension in tabular editor best practice analyzer uh, developed by Michael Kowalski from Microsoft. I sincerely hope that you are using it. So what you can do if you have best practice analyzer, uh, you can uh, hide all those columns that should be hidden, and then there is a script which will disable this uh, property is available and index automatically on all hidden columns. And uh, don't forget, in this scenario, it's a win-win situation. So we reduced the data model size while keeping our Excel users happy. Lesson learned. Power BI and tabular model are full of hidden gems, and sometimes these gems are hide, hard to find or hard to understand their possible impact. But once you manage to do it, you can make significant improvements to your Power BI solutions. As you witnessed, by simply changing the default value of the property that is hidden deeply in the tabular model, uh, I was able to increase the efficiency of the Power BI solution without sacrificing the overall user's experience and core functionalities. When I say core functionalities, I mean uh, using Excel for querying Power BI dataset. Once again, it's a win-win situation. However, I feel obliged to warn you about the possible implications of the decision to disable this property on certain columns. So attribute hierarchies are not there just by case. So they store some important information, such as the number of distinct values in that column, uh, also stored in alphabetical order. So you can think of it like an index in, in, uh, in relational databases. And consequentially, you can also quickly pull minimum and maximum values from that column. So if you're frequently using operations such as distinct count, min, max, over one single column, so without including filtering results by another column, tabular model that has the available is NDX property enabled could perform better. So in the end, should you disable or enable this property, as usual, it depends. And our final lesson for today, and you may think because it's related to auto day time, uh, that you should be better off leaving the session now, going and grabbing a beer, watching the game like Christian, uh, because yeah, I told you this is not for rookies and you're not rookie, you know what is day time and why should you not use it? That's great, but you wouldn't believe how many people that are calling themselves Power BI developers are not aware of the possible implications when using all today time? As you already learned, it's not such a big deal when you are dealing with smaller amounts of data or even with huge amounts of data, but with a reasonable time span within that data. Let's say that your data spans across 10 years. That's around 3,650 3, unique dates. And you will not pay a huge price if you leave this auto daytime option checked in terms of performance. Of course, there are many other reasons not to use it anyway, but let's focus here on the performance. So, in, in a nutshell, how auto daytime works behind the scenes, just one sentence for those of you who maybe don't know. Once you turn on or leave this turned on, this auto daytime feature, Power BI will use DAX calendar function to generate a date table. A very important thing to keep in mind, automatically generated date tables will contain dates for full years that are in the scope. So if the minimum uh, date in your table is September 15, 2019, and the maximum date is uh, September 20th of 2022, your automatically created date table will span from January 1st, 2019 till December 31st, 2022. So far, so good. Right. So here is here is my scenario. How many of you have heard about system version tables in SQL Server? Any hands or just yes, no? No. OK, I see some hands. Someone told no, never mind. So. Then I will shortly explain in a nutshell. A system version table is a special user table in SQL Server uh, designed to keep the history of data changes. So you can go back and forth in time 
uh, uh, through this table and perform point in time analysis. It's also known as a temporal table in SQL Server, so not a temporary table, but temporal table. Obviously, explaining how temporal tables work is out of the scope today, uh, but there is one extremely important thing that you should keep in mind that is relevant for those uh, temporal or system version tables. All the current records in the temporal table has a valid to uh, value set by default to 9999 31st of December. That's for all the current records that you have in uh, in SQL Server uh, system version table. Why is this important? Well, if you ask me, I don't care at all because I will not be there when that date arrives. That's that's obvious. Instead, we will maybe have dinosaurs again on our planet or new ice age. Who knows? You know what? SQL Server also doesn't care. From the SQL Server perspective, there is no difference between 31st of December 2022 and 31st of December 9999 in terms of storage. So I don't care. SQL Server doesn't care. But Power BI cares and it cares a lot if you leave all to date time option uh, turned on. So let me quickly show you what happened in this scenario. Again, go to Power BI desktop. OK, so. I'll refresh. So what we have here, we have a simple product table that contains. Let's see how many rows. 2.5 thousand. That's super small table, 2.5 thousand. And this is our table visual that shows product name and when this product will be available for sale. You see that there is only one record in our table, in our DIM product table that has available for sale that date set to this maximum value that exists in system version table this 31st of December 9999. So what happens if I go to DAX Studio and check the size of this table? So it's 2.5 thousand rows, it's nothing. But <coughs> let's, let's check. So I go to advanced view metrics. So my DIM product table, here it is, 2.5 thousand rows. Uh, that's less than, uh, this, this is in bytes, so that's less than one megabyte, 840 kilobytes, okay? But look at this table here, this automatically generated table by Power BI because of all today time. It takes 240 megabytes. And it has cardinality of almost 3 million. Why? So remember I told you it will span from the minimum to maximum date within this column. So minimum date in this column available for sale is, I don't know, 1st of January 2005. Maximum date is 31st of, Jan 31st of December 9999. So we have almost eight years in between and almost 3 million dates in between. So this is the number of dates that we have between those two uh, date values. And we have a cardinality of almost 3 million. And you see that size of this one single column is almost 200 megabytes. So what they did here, it was optimization in two minutes. Options and settings, options. Data load, uncheck, click. Data is the same, so you see nothing happened. But if we go again to DAX Studio and refresh this, now we have just our DIM product table, and there is no this uh, ghost table of 240 megabytes. This really happened. This really happened. Trust me. Uh, leaving go to daytime option turned on is. It, is generally a very bad idea, but even though, as I said, you can sometimes sneak without paying the full price of using it, there are certain scenarios like this this one that I've just shown you with uh, temporal tables where your data model will simply blow away. Therefore, never ever leave all to date time option checked and always, literally always use a proper calendar dimension. Let's quickly recap all the lessons learned from optimizing enterprise data models. 
we started by explaining how to tame direct query dragon by adjusting the logic of our DAX measures, or now by turning on this preview feature for horizontal fusion. And uh, by using either of those two approaches, we can leverage the brain of the formula engine uh, in this scenario. Then I've shown you that not having a premium capacity is not always a blocker for efficient Power BI solutions. Remember, cardinality is your number one enemy for data model size, so do your best to reduce uh, the cardinality whenever possible. Also, formatting doesn't change the way your data is stored underneath. Then I've aggregated you. Not you, but our bad data model. Uh, aggregations, once again, one of the most powerful optimization techniques, but it's not enough that you just create tables containing aggregated data. You also must make Power BI aware of them. Fourth one was for true professionals. Uh, you've seen how one hidden little property can make a huge difference in data model optimization process. And last but not least, I've shown you another strong case for not using all to date time option. Trust me, this is the main reason for many real life uh, data models being blown away, but it's especially dangerous if you're dealing with SQL Server temporal tables in Power BI. That was it from my side. Looking forward to hearing your questions, if any. Thank you very, very much, Nicola. As always, very impressive. Thank uh, you. I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't know. Raise your hands if you have any. It's your. One question from my side, um, Nicola, maybe Christian, you can um, answer that question too. Um, I think two years ago it was possible to um, change the the options of your Power BI desktop installation um, settings in the registry keys of uh, Windows. And um, maybe there was, uh, so I searched for an option that you can deactivate auto date time or other options. You can, you, you can, you don't need to change it in, uh, in uh, uh, registry. You can go here, file, and if you go to options and settings and global settings, uh, under global settings uh, data load, uh, there is an option here uh, auto date time for new files, but for existing files it will not uh, it will not uncheck. Yes, true. And when we are in an enterprise environment, then maybe there are people with um, with a packet installation of Power BI desktop, and then each user need to be this um, by themselves. So is there a way? to um, to give that option in the installation wizard or to deactivate that? I really don't know. Me neither. I don't know that I, either. I don't think so. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, it's not only bad to have it on. I absolutely agree what Nicola said, but imagine if you're having an end user who works first time, for example, with Power BI. In such a case, it's a good idea to have it on because the, the auto date time helps you to have this date hierarchy that you can have automatically the, the, the date itself and so on. Obviously, in such a case, it's it's more the purpose for the end user itself to create a report. And when you go to, to more advanced stuff, then you should definitely turn it off. But yes. for a beginner, it makes sense to have it on. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's how it starts, and then yeah. you get something like this. <laughs> but true. yeah, agree. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? I don't know if it is a question though, but I would like to add something. Uh, one thing that we have been using lately is that when we create tables, there is this one huge table that we. A check for is an SQL server for material information. So it's definitely huge. So we created kind of a buffer table and then it filters the data um, only for the products that we need to focus on for the particular report. So it turns out uh, it, it reduces the four, I don't know, 500 lines that did, 500,000 lines that it is in the SQL to only what we have. But we need to 
what we did was we created a buffer table that filters in each queue, and then that goes into the query to, to give me just the information that I need. So it's, it's, it's an FYI, it's a nice tip. Cool, thanks. Good to know, yeah. All right, looks like really no other questions or comments then. Thank you very, very much. One more time, Nicola. And let me take over again your screen then. Mm -hmm. Thank you just... for inviting me. <laughs> sure, always pleasure. happy. Hope to see you again. And no worries, yeah, we will I ask you for not. next year. <laughs> no worries, I'm here. <laughs> Perfect. Even if, if tomorrow the result will not be as wished? <laughs> yeah, I will probably forget it, forget it <laughs> until the next year. So don't okay. worry. <laughs> All right. All right, then, um, as promised, we will have a, a small looking back section uh, just from uh, Dennis and myself. We, we agreed on what we can tell about uh, the user group, the Power BI and so on. And I mean, when we have a look into this year, we did 12 meetups, obviously, because we're running it on a monthly base. But in total, since the beginning, we have now today the 40th meetups in total, which is pretty awesome from, from my point of view. And and only for this year, we had 317 unique participants. So it looks like there is really an interest and the average is 71 people. I would say it's a little bit less today. I'm sure because Croatia is playing um, or probably it's because uh, end of year, but I go with the first argument. Uh, but still, it's a lot of people from my point of view and Dennis and I are super happy with such an audience. What we saw as well that in January we had all, uh, the, the most participants with 102. So this was the peak. Um, as you see, 71 people, pretty, pretty awesome. And the goal for next year is to have it on average roughly 100. Let's see if we can make it. We invited 20 different speakers with 20 different uh, topics like today. And we had a lot of uh, features highlighted just in the uh, in the Power BI meetups. Obviously, there have been more, but these are the features that we presented during the year, and you see 48 of them. So really, a lot of releases, a lot of new stuff. And when I would pick out my favorite ones, I would go with hybrid tables, field parameters, the general available availability of execute queries against the REST API. Pretty awesome. So no premium required for that. Then we have the multiple audience in Power BI apps. Finally, we have cross-tenant data set sharing, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And we have quick measure suggestions. I tried it out this month a little bit more and it works pretty well from my point of view. So meaning you can in a natural Q&A way, ask what you're looking for and the DAX will be generated. And lastly, the last update uh, um, that we have is really the support for paginated reports with the pro license which makes a huge difference, especially if you're looking for pixel perfect reports. Really, really awesome. I don't know, Dennis, and if you have Nicola as well, anything, you, your highlights, well, what do you like most from the last updates in this year? <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's say uh, field parameters, hybrid tables, and Ah, I can't. I forgot what what we, all, all of these things that we had. So, aha, you you uh, uh, let me take a look at your new format pane. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. That's bottom bottom one. Uh, yeah. So field parameters, hybrid tables, and uh, uh, I would say from. Yeah, of course, that's my from my perspective from things I'm doing with Power BI. I know mm -hmm. that there are there were many. Uh, improvements in APIs uh, and stuff mm -hmm. like that for uh, admins. But from my uh, point of view, uh, yeah, I I'm looking forward to test this optimized ribbon. To be honest, I'm yeah. really, I'm really excited about that. And le let's keep those three. Okay, Dennis. For me, it was definitely a hybrid tables, field parameters, and multiple audiences. Yeah. Because especially the multiple audiences, um, I, everyone was waiting so long and had so many questions mm -hmm. from customers. How can I do this or that? And it's always you can only do one app. And <laughs> then we had to build solutions around like multiple workspaces and so on. And uh, this was definitely for me one of the big highlights. And I think also field parameters as you can as you can do so many things with them. Yeah. 
and especially now with this new option yeah. for the slicers, pretty cool. Yeah, All you right. can still extend them with uh, more columns, mm -hmm. and I uh, have really a lot of possibilities with them. Definitely. Yeah, that that was a little bit a feature review from the last year. Uh, looking back again, other highlights uh, for me personally, the Power BI Championship has been just awesome. Uh, all the attendees, all the solutions that we saw, but besides that as well, the, the community that, that we've built, I would say, it was just, just really awesome. And I hope we can repeat it next year. And Nicola, you have to promise to attend as well. <laughs> Promise done. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and one little highlight is as well that we got a new member when it comes to meetups. I like it very much from Dennis, the initiative that he's driving the Basel user group, because I hear that sometimes it's a little bit hard for everyone to, to join in Zurich. So the Basel one is pretty awesome. So now that I'm looking for is more here in the central part of Switzerland, probably in Ticino. So who knows, probably we'll get a little bit more in the next years and months. I think there's one question. Oh, yes, please. It's me, Mohammed. Hi, Mohammed. Hi, Christian. Hi, Nicola. Thanks, hi, Nicola. Hi. Thanks, Nicola, for uh, for the day. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Since you mentioned the API, I am trying to do something. Christian shared with me how to call, for example, the refresh history, and I managed to do it uh, via invoke uh, PowerShell. Uh, via PowerShell to invoke and read it. But with Logic App, I tried to register the app, but I didn't find in Microsoft any for, uh, any procedure and the pre-request to follow. The only things I found embedded Power BI, but I don't know if this is the one can meet what I need to success or not. So I am trying to call like HTTP via Logic App to retrieve, to retrieve the last uh refresh like what i can get from powershell but i would like to do it via logic app then i will be able to read it via report power bi report okay um what i would when um when i hear such kind of requests i recommend always to my customers to work with a so-called service principle this means you have to register an app in your Azure Active Directory and the app at, at the end is, is the service principle. Once done, you have to add the service principle into the workspace where the, the data set sits, or at least give, give uh, enough permission on the data set level uh, to this service principle. Further, um, you need to enable on a tenant setting level the yeah. Um, yeah. read and write. Yeah. Okay. Exactly, if you have for that, the tenant for perfect. the API, API for principal. So I need to add it there, to also to add it to the workspace. Yes, you need to add That's it to it. the workspace because the, the service principal need access to the data set. So you have to treat him like a user, you have to add him to the workspace and give permission. And once done, you can then go through the service principal, calling the REST API and, and get the refresh history. Via Logic App? Regardless what, uh, Logic App, Power Automate, even PowerShell, if you log in with a service principle. In my yeah, case, I'm doing it with, with Python. With PowerShell, I manage it. I manage it with PowerShell. Yeah, but I guess you log in with your credentials, not with the service principle, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. I, will, I will create service principle. Yeah, okay. that would be the best because otherwise, uh, we're deprecating the library that you can just give a master user where you give out the username and, and password. That's not best practice. And we deprecate yeah. in this library, which means you need to have a service principle at the end. This is always the best case, best scenario. You create a secret which will expire, or you can set it to, to longer, of, of obviously, to not expire like after two days. Uh, but this is for sure the best practice. And if you wish, I created, uh, where is it? I have a blog post about calling yeah. the REST API. And in there, I'm going through the steps that you need to do to create a service principle. Okay, please, uh, if you don't mind to share this with me, so I yeah, just found it. Look, I'm I'm doing it with Python, but at the end, it doesn't matter which which what you're gonna do. And you see what exactly you need to uh, to give. 
the, yeah. to the service principle, what the how the URL looks like, and this is just calling uh, calling the REST API to refresh it. In your case, you're just calling to get a history, so it's just another API call. But yeah, the yeah, principle yeah, yeah. is the yeah. same. Exa exactly. Yeah. So I posted it here in the chat, so you can have a look. Yeah, because because. So it would yep. be uh, easy for me. So, yep. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, thanks. All right, sure. All right, coming back to the looking back section and um, looking around the corner a little bit for next year, we have a lot of really awesome speakers already, uh, already, already lined up. And we have some cool speakers in the pipe, not going to mention names right now because we wait for confirmation. Dennis is laughing because he knows. But uh, I mean, in January, we will have Chris Webb and Anastasia uh, talking about, on one hand, Anastasia about uh, turning off out of date time. So it's a pretty good match, uh, ha having it heard from Nicola. And Chris Webb is also talk about, um, uh, I think the title is like BI in Excel, but not Power BI. Something like this, showing you how you can use the combination of Power BI and Excel uh, for even better reporting. Further on in February, we, we will have Reed and Gregor. Afterwards, Francesco and uh, in, in March, Ted Pattison agreed to come by in April and Pascal so far in May, if I'm not wrong. And one little hint, the January one will be in hybrid mode, but I will tell that again at, uh, uh, on my last slide. And as usual, if you wish to have a speech, feel free to reach out to us. Happy to put you on the list as well and uh, listening in what kind of uh, cool insights you have to share with the whole community. One last slide I got is um, feedback time. I mean, we really appreciate any kind of feedback, what we can improve when it comes to the user group. What would you change? What would you suggest? Uh, any kind of topics that you're missing, that you wish more, any kind of speakers we should reach out asking for participation, anything. I will just open it up now and feel free to really raise your hand, unmute yourself and, and, and just share. I see a lot. Yes, please. Um, hi, guys. I, I actually uh, I have very positive feedback for the whole community. I've had the honor to be part of this group ever since it started. And um, I'm a little English teacher from Costa Rica who landed up a job in analytics. <laughs> Don't ask me exactly <laughs> how that happened because That's I, another I actually, topic for a session. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> And um, but what I wanted to tell you is that my my personal growth through this community has been astonishing. I can consider myself an expert now, and uh, I feel the contribution not only to my to my own com to my own company, but the community itself. I've had the opportunity to collaborate with other people, Mr. Carroll, back in Basel, some other guys, and uh, and uh, I knew that the first lady that started the community, Annabelle. She was, I, I had the honor to have her come to Costa Rica and to visit me. So imagine there's there's an, an important um, feeling around this whole community. So I want to encourage you first and second, just say my piece that it, this has been a, an amazing testimony to what we can achieve. What I've learned in, through these meetings and meetups has been amazing. And I just, I just hope I was not so far. <laughs> so if you could invite me someday, to Switzerland, I'd be more than happy to go. <laughs> but um, if you can't, I'm still happy to, to be able to co to to reach out to, to each one of you and um, still making myself available if anybody ever needs some help. So thank you for, for the great job. I mean, it's, it's an honor to be part of this community. Thank you very much for this. Thanks, much, much appreciated. Anybody else, anything to share? Well, by the way, Costa Rica plays in in about two two hours in the World Cup. So just if you could, you know, provide your support. It's a, it's a hard <laughs> one. <laughs> we're playing against Germany, and I'm, I'm yeah, sorry we cannot home. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Come I will on, cheer guys. for I will cheer for Costa Rica. <laughs> good, good. That's it. I see good. <laughs> the German group. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. It's, it's a really hard one. Spain got yeah. a seven goal, so we, we actually don't have very much hopes, but <laughs> still but, get cheap. But at least probably you will help Japan. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you very much. And I mean, anytime, if you have any kind of feedback, feel free to reach out to us. If you have ideas how to improve it, uh, super, super glad to hear it. Lastly, thank you from my side and I guess from, from Dennis as well uh, for, for being with us the whole year through. I hope uh, it's, it's, yeah, you, you appreciate it, that it's valuable for you uh, because at the end, the community is for you. We're doing it for you, for ourselves and for everybody who, who participates. And I hope we will keep rolling next year even bigger. That, as a reminder, for the next future meetups, we will stay rolling like we do every first Thursday of the month. One little exception will be in January, because the first Thursday will be like the, the 5th January, and probably people are still on vacation and, and so on. So we decided to move it to the 2nd January, which will be the 12th. And as mentioned, it will be in hybrid mode. So for those who wish to participate in person, feel free to join us in the circle. Otherwise, there is a Teams invite. You can also join via Teams. One little mark, remark here is, as due to security reasons, I have to register all the people who would like to attend in person. Please drop me a mail, just name and and uh, what do I need? Name and and your company name, uh, so I can register you. That everything is as it should be. It's enough if I have it like, let's say, three days in advance. That would be awesome. So I can give the list to the uh, registration desk. Um, the topics from Anastasia, as mentioned, working with dates in Power BI, and we will have Chris Webb with uh, BI with Excel, but not Power BI. So really looking forward to having you both at the next meetup. And with that, as usual, thank you very much for joining us. Some useful links to check them out. And yeah, wish you all a wonderful evening. Hope your team will win, even if that's not really possible, if we have German and Costa Rican people in the call. <laughs> and yeah, good luck, Nicola, tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, fingers crossed. Good, good luck for Morocco and Croatia today. Yes, I would love the Morocco and Croatia. Uh, yeah, five yeah, minutes yeah, left, yeah. it looks that's like... Going, that's going to happen. <laughs> I hope that's, so, because... That's realistic. Do one now, do one, and my wife, she's Morocco, and yeah. Ah, really? Didn't know that. So now even more, go for Morocco. <laughs> yeah, please, please. We need all the support now around. Yeah. All right. Guys, don't then. forget right. my voice if we win, because I will remember you all if we win. <laughs> if That's we good. do. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. Yeah. Then thank you very much, guys. I'll leave you alone and have a wonderful day, evening, night, whatever, wherever you are. Thank Same from my side. Thanks, Nicola. All Same the best from my side. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Cheers. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Let me stop recording.